Okay. So, good afternoon. Since we are the 12 o'clock CET has passed all over, you know, the places that of the people that they participate. I would like to welcome you to the fourth Athena talk for 2024. I will give you some introduction and I'm very happy that my colleague from the University of Maribor uh, is here uh, with me uh, in order you know, to give you a very brief introduction about the Athena Talks. Athena Talks is, are, we run together with the, within the University Alliance of Athena for four years. We invite experts you know, from all the topics. Of course, we are mainly biased from engineering, but we, this, this will stay between us. Uh, we invite, you know, experts from all over the world to speak about their research, their initiatives and the opportunities uh, for our research and academic and student community. Uh, I would like also to welcome Maria Zakintinaki, as I can see. And um, it's a great, uh, within the last three years, and we start now the fourth, we have organized more than 110 uh, uh, invited talks. Uh, you can go to our YouTube channel or Yorgos, my colleague, can share with you the link of our uh, research book that we publish uh, through the Athena and we summarize all the Athena talks that we have organized together with the links, abstracts. We have invited some of people that, you know, Nobel Prize they have won. We have, you know, people like uh, um, Muru, Gerald Muru, uh, that he got the Nobel Prize in lasers. And we are planning to invite more, you know, through our links because it's a little bit challenging to um, contact them. And within this initiative, the motivation is like to show that how an alliance can help universities, you know, to be in contact with scientists with a very high profile uh, officers from the European Commission. And this creates the deep, somehow, the deep transformation of the universe is like how through the networking you bring in your community the best of the best even though that they are not with you but virtually they are here and this is how we would like to see whatever we are doing in Athena as a part of our collaboration uh, the impact of this alliance to everyone so within this framework I would like to, to welcome I will start you know following the old rules uh, uh, Milva Calbonaro uh, and uh, Danny, Danny, you know, I'm sorry, but I cannot pronounce very well your surname, Banten Bruche. Uh, I will give some introduction that they are going to speak to us about space and geodata to foster innovation and create new job opportunities. I can see within uh, the, the audience is my colleague Ignatiadis, Panagiotis Ignatiadis, and he has highlighted, you know, the impact of this talk. Panagiotis together with Georgos, they run the Athena Grant Office or they try to start to establish, you know, the Athena Grant Office and we can see the opportunities that even in the research, this space and geodata data um, are, are of a great importance for various activities. Uh, I will speak about Milva Carbonaro for a short. Milva Carbonaro is a CEO coordinator of GSIC Association since May 23, 2023. Previously, he was a director from 2017 to 2023, studies on business and economics, graduated in hum humanities and master's degrees in open distance learning. This is another initiative that also in, a, in the new era of Athena, we would like to integrate humanities with technologies. And thank you very much, Milva, for this. This is our first demonstration of this action. Um, uh, more than 30 years experience in EU funded project management administration as, as well as on the promotion of pilot training and mobility project, primary coordinator conduct of the Erasmus Plus Sector Skills Alliance, EO4GO, and the Knowledge Alliance uh, G cases. She also supports quality assurance processes for VET activities. Uh, more recently, she coordinates EO4GO Alliance born from the legacy of the previous project that we mentioned. So I think that she has the, the profile and the experience to, to lead us and travel with us, you know, within this, the topic that they are going to present, that I repeat, the title Space and Geodata to Foster Innovation and Create New Job Opportunities. And she will be supported by the second speaker, um, a contribution from Belgium, if, you know, I can see well, from KU Louvain, a very, um, 
a very well reputed you know institution and one of the oldest in Europe um, and uh, Danny is a research manager at KAU Leuven and scientific director of GSIC Association uh, that, as we have seen, also Milva participates. His research topic relates to the impact of the application of GI standards on the performance of work profess, uh, processes. So I stop here in order to give the floor to the speakers to introduce us to the topic. All of us, we are potential students, like to continue, you know, our, my conversation with Milva, and the floor is to Milva, as I have learned, she will start. Milva, the floor is yours, and thank you. Thank you very much, Costa, for uh, your introduction. Um, yeah, today we we wish to speak uh, to you about uh, space and geodata and geoformation, which are, let's say, enable or innovation and job opportunities in Europe. Um, what I will I'm going to give you next, please. It's uh, let's say the general political and uh, and uh, uh, economic framework why we believe that developed skills uh, within the space geoinformation sector would be of, of great importance for your students and in general for uh, your work. Um, you know all of that uh, 2023, no, no, go, go back. 2023 is, uh, is the year of, for skills, the year of skills. And this is because the commission understood and realized that the lack of skills is, a, is a really a challenge for all European companies. Companies. And so uh, this is a challenge faced in all economic sectors, more or less. Um, and uh, uh, of course, it is reflected in the different uh, poli uh, policy, political priorities that address, uh, uh, let's say, um, the, 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 the actions of the European Union in this uh, era. Um, these priorities that you that we are showing you here are those which uh, are more, uh, let's say, uh, affected or better to say supported by the use of space data services and applications. Um, of course, we all know very well the, the green transition and the digital transition, but uh, since the last years, the COVID crisis first, now all the, the, the wars uh, around, uh, um, let's say, uh, quite close to Europe, uh, it has been uh, recognized that there is a, a huge need or, of reaching the EU strategic autonomy in key sectors. And um, to do that, it is uh, considered of great importance that the uptake from final users, uh, from the society in general, of the use of space data services and applications. And uh, by the way, in, the, in her State of the Union uh, um, address this year, uh, still uh, uh, the President uh, Ursula von der Leyen announced uh, uh, they, uh, they are working uh, in the definition of a EU strategy on space data. So uh, you see uh, how this is conceived, considered important from the Commission point of view. Uh, this is needed also um, for, uh, to support the policies in terms of security and defense. And of course, uh, we can't forget uh, the, the main pillars uh, uh, of social rights and in all activities, uh, equal opportunities and inclusiveness should be announced. So to face all these priorities, uh, new skill sets are needed. So uh, if we go to the next slide, we can see uh, also that this uh, uh, paramount importance of skills is underlined in, a, in Article 6, of the EU space program for the current program in 2021-2027. You will see, you can see here in Article 6 that um, to support the uh, an innovative and competitive uh, union um, space program, um, it is really needed to announce the provision of education and training activities towards the different actors, so professionals, students, graduates, and of course, entrepreneurs um, also um, um, putting all the different initiatives in synergy uh, also at the national and regional level for the development of advanced skills and this is exactly the purpose of the the partnership by the way i was mentioning before we started uh, with our exchanges with costas and so on 
Um, related to this uh, uh, political framework, I would like now to give you a bit of information regarding uh, the state of health, let's say, of the industry in this particular sector, because this is particularly important to understand really the potential for economic growth, so to boost entrepreneurship towards your students, for instance, and uh, um, of course, uh, connected to this, uh, the importance for uh, um, employment, to an increase the employment rate, the, the job opportunities available. If you can go in the next slide, please, we can see um, um, in this particular, uh, these figures are mostly related to one specific uh, subsector, let's call it like this, uh, of the space uh, program, which is the one specifically related to Earth observation and addressed, uh, for instance, by the Copernicus uh, program. Um, every year, the uh, European Association of Remote Sensing Companies, ERSC, perform a survey towards uh, uh, companies working in the Earth observation sector. You can see here the numbers of the company interviewed, their employees, the revenues they have, and so on. And you can see here, which is particularly important, the growth rate they have over the last five years, which is quite significant, 7.5%. Um, you can see on the uh, right side of the slide, uh, the, the companies in the uh, sample considered uh, their distribution among countries. It is not a surprise that the first countries are those that traditionally are more active uh, since years in the space sector. And uh, you see that uh, an effort is needed to have the, the space data and services and application used more also in other countries. Let me check where is Portugal. It's not that bad, but could be better, for instance. Okay, in the next slide, uh, we see um, uh, graphics regarding the employment perspective, still, uh, um, let's say, derived from the ERSC survey towards companies in Earth of Service sector and you can see that both in uh, 2022 and now in 2023 uh, the companies uh, um, foresee to have an increase in their staff uh, a slight increase in 52 percent more or less of the cases and a significant increase in 19 percent of the companies last year and more than 20 this year so this means plenty of job opportunities for our students uh, in the next slides we are also going to see uh, for instance uh, what um, how difficult it is for companies to hire new people. Uh, so the, the, the fact uh, what's happen, what is happening in reality is that companies do not manage or have serious difficulties in hiring new staff. And uh, you can see here the percentage among uh, the sample um, is 77%, which is very, very high. And uh, uh, what is happening is that uh, re literally uh, steal each other the talents because as you can see here among the reasons for these dif difficulties uh, they, there is the competitive marketplace so what I was mentioning they steal the, the experienced people each other so um, experienced people are not uh, uh, so easy to find and normally company know that they have to invest in the training of newly hired staff um, in certain countries, uh, there is a lack of training in our observation, for instance, and in general in space downstream uh, um, topics. And also very important, they uh, complain the lack of transversal and business oriented skills. So it is important to provide our students not only with uh, so-called hard skills related to the technical and uh, to the knowledge and skills related to that specific topic, but also transversal skills and soft skills are very important to enhance their employability. Uh, so in the next slide, we can see again, what are the reasons for hiring and uh, there is an expected increase in the execution of projects in the business sales but also there is the adoption of new technologies and this is particularly important for IT, ICT professionals in general and your topics for instance uh, because they really even uh, 
in uh, the space sector, uh, people skilled in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on is very important. They are very in high request. And uh, why it is difficult to fill the open solution? The number of candidates is too low. So there is the need to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, attract talents, students towards this topic. And not only in uh, ICT or space related, uh, uh, let's say, domain, but also in other uh, vertical domains, because uh, space data services and uh, um, application, as Danny will uh, explain better in a, uh, in a moment, are, uh, let's say, at the service of the different sector, could be cultural, could be uh, tourism, could be automotive, could be construction, could be energy. I can go on uh, in this uh, exemplification. Uh, lastly, I would like to give you some figures. It's it's the, uh, the next slide and last for my set, let's say, on the growth perspective of uh, the sector, which is uh, considered from the different point of view of the different segment of what we call the downstream sector, which is, as I was saying, related to the use of space data services and applications. It's not considering here all the manufacturing side of building satellites, radar, launchers, and so on, which is what we called upstream and maybe could be the subject of another webinar. Um, so uh, from a, a report uh, on the space economy from Euroconsult in 2024, it seems that the share of global space economy for the downstream sector amounts to $377 billion, of which it is estimated that the European share is approximately the 23%, so approximately $87 billion. So if we consider an average, even high cost of uh, uh, an employed person uh, of around a uh, hundred thousand uh, euro for instance we could say that this figure show us that at least um, uh, 867,000 jobs are provided in the sector in Europe. We have also the market report 2023 from USPA the European Agency for the Space Program um which is uh, um it's considering the different uh, sides let's say of uh, uh, the segment of the space economy and the space program so we have a uh, earth observation eo data market where we have uh, an expected uh, growth rate economic growth rate by 2031 of 3.5% and uh, uh, for only for the data market, only for data. But when it comes to the Earth observation value added services market, the numbers are higher. So 6.8% in terms of expected economic growth by 2031. And in the Earth report, still for Earth observation, the uh, um, estimation for economic growth is even higher, 7.5%, considering both data market and value added services market. But this is not, not only, uh, but as I was saying, the space downstream uh, sector does not only comprise Earth observation, but we have also the navigation positioning and timing timing side segment of the space economy which is what uh, the galileo um, let's say program and here the market revenues are expected to uh, grow at a rate of uh, um, um, more than nine percent uh, in the next decade so reaching a total of uh, 492 billions by 2031 and last but not least, you have to consider also the market related to uh, the global satellite communications, uh, which value was valued more than $71 billion in 2021, but uh, it is expected to uh, expand at a rate of 9.5% from 2022 to 2030. So as a conclusion, we can see 
we can say that uh, the compound annual growth rate of the space application downstream markets are higher compared to other major EU industry uh, like uh, information technology. Here there is example the example of the rate growth rate of 4.3 percent uh, in the period 2016-2020. So um, a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurship, for students, for new market, and so on. And uh, now it's how we reach this and how can we work uh, on this on the sector. This is uh, what. Uh, uh, my colleague Danny is going to go through in the next slide. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Milva. <clears throat> so I will dive a little bit uh, deeper in what uh, the sector exactly entails. So how should you understand the space and geoinformation sector? Um, I start with uh, this slide to explain that space, the space geoinformation sector is quite a vast domain. Um, so it is also interconnected with other domains, other sciences, other technologies. So it's not a thing in isolation um, for different reasons. Um, we have in one of the previous projects um, tried to create a common language, uh, not only for scientific purposes, but also for educational purposes, also for business purposes. We call it our body of knowledge on geographic information and earth observation, which we will further expand, including also SATCOM and uh, PNT subsectors, and even connected to other sectors. Um, this body of knowledge or this common language, let's say, um, is um, providing a perspective from the scientific, the technology and the application perspective. Um, sciences, there is connection to many other sciences, uh, the more, well, the, the blue ones at the left, uh, sometimes very logic, like if the link to informatics <laughs> is very clear or statistics, mathematics, there is a lot of mathematics, but even philosophy, psychology, I will give one example. Uh, one of the application domains is to understand in the geospatial field, for example, how people behave in traffic. So how do they look at traffic situations on the road, uh, especially, for example, how children look at the cars and the other bikes and the pedestrians and so on. And so this is an aspect of physical behavior, but it's also an aspect how the psychology is working and how people are behaving. So there is a lot of interesting projects ongoing in research to model, taking into account psychology, uh, how people behave in, in the space, but space not in the higher atmosphere, but rather on the ground, so on the earth. Of course, uh, there are also a lot of interconnected uh, technologies, um, information science, uh, but also geography, geology, engineering, space technology per se is also relevant, etc. So there's everywhere three dots because there is no single, um, well, it's not fixed boundary. We connect to many different technologies as well. And then more importantly, even is that um, all the technologies and the data and the services are applied in different areas. Uh, of course, more obviously, uh, if we speak about Copernicus, it's used to monitor climate change, um, environmental aspects, but also it's used in agriculture, for example, precision farming, or spying farmers at the EU level, for example, what they are, are they doing in their field? Um, but also even in tourism, in cultural heritage, in transport and mobility. So the application domains are very vast and the technologies, the data, uh, the space data, but also the in situ data that we collect on the earth are combined and used to support all these activities. So that's quite important. And in previous projects and also in, in, the, 
in the future, we will maintain this body of knowledge because it defines all the concepts, theories, methodologies, technologies, applications, describe it in a systematic way, and especially also provides the link between the different concepts. Uh, if we speak about space, if you don't know about it, of course, you know all about all these satellites surrounding our Earth. Um, they're all in orbit, as we call it. So they have a kind of fixed path and then they take pictures. This is the example of Sentinel-2. It's one of the Sentinels of Copernicus. And then with that, they provide images and data sending it to Earth and scientists and other people can then process the data, use the data to have answers on certain particular questions. So um, of course, ESA as a European Space Agency is involved, but also in other continents, you have NASA and other um, space agencies and other organizations doing this type of work. Um, there is a lot of Copernicus uh, data focusing more on Earth observation. You will hear sometimes about sentinental, sentinentals uh, and a number. Um, they have been launched since uh, almost 10 years now, more or less, a little bit more, I think. Um, uh, and of course, that's what you might have in mind. You see sometimes on television, the launch of a satellite with a lot of noise and a lot of uh, energy consumption and then uh, it's launched in orbit and then the satellites are doing something uh, high in the in in uh, orbit um so uh, maybe interesting for you is to know that only for copernicus because there's a lot of other uh, satellites weather satellites communication satellites security or military satellites and so on but let's say that the copernicus ones there are currently seven uh, are having a particular field of interest, like for example, the number one is more for weather oriented applications, two is more on land monitoring, soil, water management, forest cover, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also marine or maritime surveys, for example, big ships that have oil spills, they can be monitored and then they can be captured if they have a big spill of oil in the ocean, etc. Then three is more focusing on oceanography. Four is everything related to atmospheric elements, for example, uh, nitrine dioxide, ozone, and many other parameters that are relevant for the health of our Earth. Uh, the other pollutants are more in Sentinel-5 uh, Sentinel, uh, and greenhouse gases. SP is a particular one that really focuses on air quality. Uh, uh, related aspects, uh, and then the more topographic elements of the ocean, because that's very hard to collect. Well, on the earth, on the, the land, it's easy to do. There are other techniques for doing that. But of course, in the ocean, we just can't walk in the ocean. So there uh, we collect through uh, these satellites. Uh, then at, as a result, this is just one example. Uh, you have these nice pictures. It's almost pieces of art, but with expertise and already uh, for a long time, by the way, that's maybe less known, but artificial intelligence is already used for more than 30 years in our sector. Uh, try to derive automatically certain information because if you have to do that all manually, it's almost impossible. Uh, but this is done and you have uh, huge amounts of data coming in on a daily basis. Uh, but of course, there are new developments and it's not only the initiatives at the EU level, but there is a lot of data from the Chinese, the Russians, India, the Middle East, and now even in African countries are launching satellites, even universities, single universities are launching small sats. You have mega constellations, you have the private sector, everyone knows SpaceX, of course, of uh, Musk. Um, it's commercial, but so it's full of <laughs> satellites there doing specific things. Um, not everything is for the same purpose, unfortunately, but it's quite crowded up there, but it's delivering huge amounts of data while 20 years ago, you had to wait for a cycle to get some data. Now you, you have terabytes every almost every hour of data so big data for example is a, 
a real big issue for our sector. Uh, this is a slide uh, explaining a little bit on space, uh, the value chain, as we call it, and explaining also a little bit the different parts. Um, you have to the left of this uh, slide, you see uh, you have on the ground, on Earth, a lot of activities because you can't do it only in space. You have ground stations, you have telescopes to monitor satellites, to monitor debris, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have, of course, the operators that operate satellites. You have launchers that support satellites to go in orbit and then do something there. Uh, but then you have all the you have the data sector, all these data. You have resellers. You have uh, those that make applications with it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and the idea of the downstream value chain is that you do, you work together, you have an infrastructure, you create services in, also infrastructure as a service, different types, and then you do something with the data because the image itself, most of the images are a regular user. If you are not an expert, it's very difficult to interpret it. So you need to do something with it and derive useful information. We call it GI, Ge geographic information service from there. That then can be used by end users to, for example, to monitor air quality or other parameters, etc. So this is this whole ecosystem, as we call it, um, and uh, by the way, uh, related to education and training, but also research, the commission really wants to improve these downstream sites so that there is more uptake, more interesting applications, also for schools, for example, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very exciting field, but we need a lot of people and a lot of organizations not only academic, but private sector, public sector bodies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I tried here to uh, explain a little bit because you might hear sometimes um, information or, or interventions on, yes, the upstream sector and the space downstream sector. To be clear, Space for Geo is focusing on the downstream sector. Um, Sometimes I say, okay, the upstream sector, that's the engineers, that's not very respectful because it's a lot more, but let's say that it's covering many aspects like the manufacturing of satellites with engineers, but also mathematicians, physics, uh, science, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you have those that are specialized in operating like SpaceX, but also NASA and ESA, uh, et cetera or other space agencies, but it's more, it's going beyond that. It's also about management, organizing the processes, and in particular, space traffic management is a very political sensitive and a very a difficult topic now, uh, currently in discussion. There will be a new space law at the European level in which also Kiel Leuven is involved to uh, support implementation and the development of it. But for example, you heard probably about the risk of uh, the collision between satellites, the creation of debris. Uh, so you see uh, the picture there, it's very crowded there and uh, a lot of things might happen in the future. So the collision and also collision between a satellite and a small piece of debris can create uh, tremendous, tremendous hazards. So all these things are under consideration now. And as you know, space is not like Earth, where we have boundaries of countries with, okay, what can you do in your countries, in laws and so on, but in space, yeah, everyone can do whatever he or she likes to say so. So there is more uh, legislation and uh, other ruling uh, necessary and that's ongoing. So, but that's upstream. Uh, the downstream, it's already said by Milva is uh, three pieces or three subsectors, let's say. The Earth observation is really to create with data insights on what's happening on Earth, but that can be many things, as I said before. Uh, then, okay, your mobile would not work without satellites for communication. They are very specialized. And then you have everything related to positioning, navigation, and timing. It's not here on the slide, but of course you have everything also related to defense and security. So this is a big issue. And also for the upstream sector, um, the space law will look into a sustainability and safety in space itself. 
sustainability or impact on Earth with the space sector. So you have, of course, all these debris, but also you have, uh, if you saw the last SpaceX uh, uh, going in uh, orbit was not very successful at the end, but okay, there was some success, but it exploded. So all these pieces are falling down to Earth, etc. So you have impact on Earth. And then security is also about cyber security. So there's a clear link with ICT, challenges but it's also physical security of the satellites nowadays especially with the international tensions this is a hot topic as well and this downstream space sector also makes the links to in situ data and geospatial data that's usually the data we also collect on earth not via satellites so you have also for example airplanes airborne uh, images that you collect with an airplane that is usually also integrated and even citizen science is integrating uh, with other data sources coming from remote sensors uh, in the satellite. So that's basically, let's say, the overall picture. Just two examples on what you then can do. I don't uh, show it live, but I checked uh, windy.com. Maybe some of you also use it. Uh, this is integrating geospatial data on Earth with data coming from uh, the meteor world that have sensors on Earth, but use also satellite imagery. This is combined. And for example, this is just an image. I'm living at the blue dot here. And I was checking whether I could take my bike to the campus without a rain shower. Uh, and uh, by the way, I succeeded more or less to avoid the showers. Uh, but this is an, a, an example of an application where geospatial data and earth observation data are integrated in an application. Another one uh, being developed or supported by our university also, um, you have Eurocontrol. So all the flights that you can imagine are monitored. And there you have Galileo and GPS um, data flows coming in live in each plane, you have that. You combine it with geospatial data and then you can monitor and track. And by the way, I have also a version that you can combine with weather data that come from the other uh, data sources. And with this also pilots, but also if you go on holiday, I use it to track my flights or uh, checking the flight of my wife coming in uh, on holiday or whatsoever. So you can do with these applications a lot of things. And these are just two examples, global applications, because these two, I'm guessing that some of you already used Flight Router 24 uh, because it's globally available. So, and the other one as well. So these are just two examples. Um, and I want to end with um, the link and also highlighting the big innovative potential and changes we will see or we see already uh, in the geospatial sector and that's covering space, earth observation, whatever on the ground, on the globe. Um, there is, well, I will not discuss all because there are so many developments, not only in artificial intelligence, machine learning, but also the new type of uh, managing data. Um, we have new ways of modeling, we have a lot of new ways of visualizing techniques, um, virtual, augmented, mixed reality. We have serious gaming. We have natural language processing. So we uh, capture a lot of the developments in different sectors like ICT and other sectors. And we need these new developments and they are more and more integrated um, in what we do. And not because we just want to play, but because we need it to find sometimes the well, the answers on very complex questions. Uh, you have also 3D modeling, you have many, many, many things. And here is just the overview uh, picture of what is happening in the Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, which is a mixture, it's a standardization body, but where universities, private companies, public sector bodies uh, work together to uh, apply these new technologies in the geospatial and the earth observation field. And I want to conclude with this slide. So as Milva highlighted, we are definitely, we really, we need a lot of people, um, new people, young people, older people, it doesn't matter. We need people that have talents, but also especially are curious. And it's of course not only 
technological skills. Of course, it's a lot of technology, data experts. We need data analysts. We need application developers, computer scientists, system engineers, but we need also people that can think about the problem and translate the problem in a process in which research and more operational uh, steps and activities are taking place. So business analysts, problem solvers, I call them, but many more because we will also in the space suit uh, Erasmus Plus Blueprint uh, project that will start early next year, we will start to define what we call occupational profiles for which we will then develop uh, training materials um, yeah, in different uh, formats and through different channels. And with this, I want to uh, end the talk. I hope I didn't talk too long. Uh, thank you. And, and I hope there are some, or maybe there are some questions or maybe already some candidates to work in our field. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. You know, I'm the first candidate. I'm curious. <laughs> so I volunteered myself, you know, immediately. You know, don't wait the others, you know, just hire me. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. So... Uh, I will give the floor to the audience. I have some questions uh, and also, you know, some suggestions. Um, so, questions? So, you have only one candidate, so you should hire me. The other <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I'm, I'm going to start with the questions. And uh, my, my first question is uh, the following. You mentioned that the space data, however, I would like to highlight that your presentation, I will, it, it was the highest demonstration of the multidisciplinary, the multidisciplinary character that anyone has a job. Either you are a philosopher, either you are in finance, either you are uh, working in religion affairs, you know, you have a job in technology. I, I'm closing now the parenthesis in order to ask. Um, you mentioned that the space data somehow can have an application to the cultural heritage. Can yes. you please elaborate? This is my first question. And my second question, I would like to learn more about this Erasmus Blue project that you mentioned at the beginning. So the first one is like how the space data can interact with the cultural heritage. We're in Greece, you know, they will have yep. a lot of kind of this yep. kind of property. We're using technology to maintain, you know, and preserve. Yeah, uh, uh, very briefly, I see two uh, angles for doing this. Uh, one in the geospatial field. By hazard, last week, one of my team members uh, obtained her PhD exactly in the topic of, and it was called ontologies, building ontologies for developing and maintaining cultural heritage assets. Uh, and she applied it in Ecuador. She was coming from Ecuador, where they also have a lot of uh, very uh, interesting things. But that's uh, from the geospatial field. So it's a combination. What, because in geospatial field, what we do normally is we model our world, the physical world and the virtual world. Virtual, for example, is administrative boundaries or a political boundary or whatever you can't see in the landscape, but it's there. Uh, the real world is, of course, the buildings, it's the streets, the rivers, the digital terrain model. It's everything you can imagine. And that, of course, includes also historical buildings, but also future constructs. So that's why we are interested in augmented and virtual reality, because in urban and spatial planning, for example, we want to take into account the, the historical settings and uh, assets, but also how things could change in an urban or another area. So geospatial technology is used already a lot to uh, maintain, visualize, and also, for example, a typical application is for tourists to find and query about exactly temples or other historical buildings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, in space um, is used more and more, and by the way. Um, if you are interested to know more about geography, geospatial space, and you do not want really to become all or to know all these technical aspects, uh, National Geographic is a very good source. 
And there have been very interesting articles on how you can use space technology and the data to even discover not known uh, cultural heritage uh, assets. For example, several ones have been discovered in the Latin and Middle America because they are uh, covered by forestry and even not known before and by space, the data from coming from space, they have been discovered. For That's an example. Uh, and there, for that type of application, you use the real remote sensing data and you then can visualize and extract and also manipulate and do some um, uh, algorithms with machine learning and artificial intelligence to extract or highlight the covered, let's say the covered cultural heritage assets. That's an example. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So I would like, thank you very much, Danny. I'm going to request to you, if it's possible to send me a draft of this PhD thesis, you know, after this talk in order to read it and, you know, come closer and I would follow your advice to uh, go to the National Geographic and, you know, place, you know, some keywords like technology and cultural heritage, you know, to identify more well, information. Fine. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you. And I have a, a, one more question. I have like, I like very much, you know, about the flight data, the flight rider, uh, radar application and how, you know, the space data and, you know, this navigation can help in order to have this visual, to have, you know, this uh, visualized um, uh, experience. Uh, I would like to ask how much artificial intelligence can impact the collection of all this data in order to have an automated artificial intelligence, let's say, flight control. So we need, yeah. we don't need, you know, the flight controllers, so many, we're going to have supervisors that, you know, artificial intelligence will uh, control, but also invent some pathways that the humans, they cannot, you know, realize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a... Uh... A complicated question because I'm only aware because we did a project on that, uh, how it is used for the data, automatic data processing. I will give uh, that example. I know though that the engineering people are trying to look into this because uh, of course, uh, the difficult thing of space is that it's far from here. <laughs> you can't just walk out of your office and go and visit space. It's not working like this. Uh, it's far away. And also, by the way, uh, all of you might have heard or know about digital twins. The first digital twin was built by NASA uh, 40 years ago <laughs> uh, because you can't just say, OK, I am going quickly to the moon <laughs> to collect some data and to present it. No, you collect images and you build a kind of digital version of the moon, how the moon looks like. And the same is done by Mars. But that's more to collect information. And you need to put intelligence in the way the satellites and especially the sensors in the satellites are working. Uh, that's already done, but to be honest, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know the details. I know that other departments in Keleuven are involved in Copernicus satellites. Uh, even recently in one of the last satellites, there are three components built by Keleuven. But I know it's happening, but how it, exactly it's working in the satellites and in the communication between satellites and the satellite system itself, I have, to be honest, no clue. Uh, mm -hmm. Regarding artificial intelligence in the data, I will provide one example, very practical, which was, uh, unfortunately, we don't have very detailed papers on this because it was uh, also very sensitive. You know, uh, SATSEN is one of the EU agencies and SATSEN is it's situated in Madrid uh, and they're responsible for border control and all these things. Yeah, and they're using a lot of satellite data to monitor what is happening. And also there is a link to security, of course, and so on. And one of the questions of them was, is it possible because they know that, for example, human trafficking between, for example, Africa and, and Middle East and Europe is happening using particular devices, um, car, special cars, trucks, uh, small boats, etc. cetera. Um, and then by the way, uh, you, the idea was, can we monitor, can we discover the flows, the human trafficking flows using satellite imagery? 
Uh, and then we had another department at K-Leuven focusing on artificial intelligence. They had some algorithms. It was adopted or uh, adapted rather to try to do exactly this because you can't do this manually. There are so many flows <laughs> of boats and uh, vehicles and that was done and that was seemed to be possible. So we found an algorithm. It's already integrated in software of a company to do similar things. And there that is really done with artificial intelligence and machine learning. So you learn how certain objects of which you know it's this type of boats and vehicles can be discovered automatically rather than manually or with a lot of interpretation. Of course, there's always some noise or bias, but uh, that could be relatively easily solved. And that's an example of a new application. And by the way, Copernicus data were not useful for these because the resolution was not good enough. So we had to take uh, commercial data provided by, by commercial uh, data providers that manage also certain satellites. But there is a lot possible. And in the engineering part, I, I'm not so sure uh, how it's happening now, but I'm, I heard a lot of things are happening there as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. I will provide the floor to uh, Yorgos and then to Remy. This was the sequence of the raising hand. Yeah. Yorgos? Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you for a presentation for both of you, Milva and Danny. Um, Danny actually partially uh, answered my, my question because my question was about uh, the uh, extent of public sector information uh, in this satellite data. Uh, where, where's the limit uh, between mm. the public sector information, which is available to everyone, and then uh, for those that is maybe commercial or, of course, for security reasons, mm. uh, we don't have access to others. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And the reality is that it's very mixed. Um, of course, there is a, a political or a policy of the EU, of the Commission. Everything from Copernicus is freely available. So from the seven sentinels, all the data coming in, and there is for each, um, there are six uh, Copernicus services. And you should understand as a service, as a platform, with applications and tools for you to extract data, for example, for Greece or for a city or whatever, your place of interest, and then to do some pre-processing, and then you get the data, and then as an expert, you can work with the data, extract other information, and so on and so on. So you can do a lot of things. To give one example, uh, CNN, so the big uh, media chain in the US, they used to report on television on air quality, they use one of the Copernicus services. So they extract the data and they show it like a weather map, a regular weather map on television. So very simplified on air quality. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all free. There is other data sources also, historical data from the US and so on, that is also you can get for free, etc. And then other data sets or uh, even public sector bodies charge still for some data. Uh, and of course, the commercial ones, they sell their data. Um, and then you have particular data collected by universities via their satellites. Usually that's free for research. So in reality, the, the picture or the landscape is very mixed. Uh, but if it's EU, if they um, invested in a sentinel or a satellite or a collection of data, it's a policy to make it freely available. Yeah, so thank you, because uh, our students are by some courses uh, on data management and so on, they are already using uh, this, this data and we just uh, had a hackathon with them uh, a yeah. few uh, weeks ago then, because we, we actually are using the link to the European data portal. So yeah, uh, yeah, that we yeah. Get to, to the goal where we want to. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both for the question and the answer. And the floor is to Remy. Uh, thank you, Gustav. Uh, first and foremost, I will uh, thank uh, Milva and Danny for a great presentation. And my question is kind of uh, 
divided uh, uh, to both of them. Uh, so um, the amount of information uh, you get from satellites, uh, how are they going to accelerate how we see the uh, jobs we have today? And how is the information used uh, in a way that uh, construct, uh, how is the, sorry, just need to find the words. Um, how is the information used uh, to uh, shape the industries around the globe? Yeah. Um, shall I start, uh, Milva? Maybe you can add also. Yeah, or yeah. do you want to start? Well, it's a, maybe start. It's a very, I mean, a difficult question because globally, uh, it's difficult to uh, to understand how this can shape. Uh, if I understood well the the the, the question, uh, the um, the jobs, uh, the job market, uh, and so on, the profession, and so on. Uh, what I, I have to say is that in all the, the findings of the, the survey we made those in previous projects and we are uh, other projects, uh, twin projects are still go running right now, is that uh, uh, yes, uh, we need, uh, people need uh, so-called hard skills, so they need knowledge on the different fields, uh, the different application fields which can take benefits uh, from the space data, but they also need knowledge on how they can use the data and to derive information useful for them in their job. Uh, but uh, what is also evident uh, and uh, seems kind of trivial aspect, but it's true, is that uh, um, you can't, uh, of course, we monitor the trending, uh, the, the trending picture of occupation in the field, which is, as we were mentioning, is in a way horizontal to all the vertical sectors, and which is also very much affected by the mega trends, which are also the same in the ICT in general field with artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. But the point is that it is uh, the, the, the technology is going on, uh, is progressing at a so uh, high speed uh, pace that uh, for sure uh, the, the job uh, anybody will do in uh, 10 years uh, or even more will maybe uh, will be completely different from the one is doing from how it is doing today and uh, <clears throat> in a way you can't really mm, perfectly imagine at the moment and probably there will be a lot of job which doesn't yet exist you know so um this is the way the technology is, is expected to affect the labor market and what it is of paramount importance for employability of people and to let's say uh, be prepared for these uh, huge changes is to have uh, um, those soft skills that companies are looking for so the ability to learn the ability to adapt to change and all these things can be acquired not by a single course can be acquired through a direct um, collaboration uh, between uh, uh, training and education providers and the labor market in general. I don't say only company because a big part of the labor market, for instance, in, in our case, is provided by public authorities, for instance, which need uh, um, professionals able to understand the data, to process them, but also uh, from the decision makers point of view, uh, mm, professionals who know that what they need and how they can, uh, let's say, uh, steer the activities of technician in order to, to, to take, uh, let's say, uh, informed decisions. So uh, I would insist uh, that uh, uh, on the fact that we can't really predict uh, the impact, but we can predict uh, a huge impact in general anyway. And so it is important that people is prepared to continue learning uh, according to the pace of technology. Uh, yeah, I just want to add a, a, a small other thing that is in my opinion also relevant. I think we go towards a society um, the work processes, the settings in which we work will be more and more multi and interdisciplinary. Uh, so the time that you work uh, in a stovepipe separately, what you are doing, and another one is doing something else, and 
you give your results to the next step in the process. I think there is more and more co-creation and co-working on particular challenges and, and issues. So um, uh, I think uh, we will go towards a situation where in, in working in activities, you have the engineer together with the data expert, with the ICT guy uh, and, and, and other people. It depends a little bit. Um, so also the way we organize the work is already shifting and will shift further in my opinion. So also from that perspective, you need um, two things. Of course, you need your specialization uh, in which you, your smaller subfield in which you are really expert, but then you need also to understand um, the basics of other aspects, like for example, if I spoke about space traffic management, I'm not a lawyer, not at all, but in one of these projects, I should understand how uh, UN treaties work, how the European law system works, etc. I should not be expert, but I should understand. And the other way around, the lawyers should not be technical experts in space and so on, or in earth observation, but at least they should know what is a satellite and how the principles work. So also knowledge uh, development and transfer and skills development will not only be on your own domain, which is already vast, but also you need hooks to the other um, domains to at least understand uh, what the other people are telling because you have to work together. So that's what I mean with multi and interdisciplinary work, but that means also, also have a minimum knowledge base of the other aspects. Uh, so yeah, that's that complicates things, but that makes also things more, well, attractive in my opinion, and especially for people to enter. Um, that's why I, I uh, stressed in the conclusion slide also, we need also people that just think and try to think about the problem, to solve the problem together with different uh, people with different backgrounds. That's basically the message I want to add uh, to what Milva was saying. Uh, thank you for the answer. I agree. Uh, it's, uh, it also simplifies how you work because then you define it more. So thank you for a good answer, both of you. Thank you. I, I think that this is a good point to close, you know, because a lot of words that I will keep as a key word, you know, they have been listed. First of all, impact. How many times, you know, Silva, Carbonaro mentioned the word impact. Impact is the virtual exchange Erasmus program that we have uh, in order to promote the soft skills development uh, within mm. virtual exchanges. So we are bingo. I will stop here and then we can use this video for dissemination purposes uh, that shows you know, the importance of the, the soft skills. So also, Carbona um, Milva and Dani, we are running the last three years through the European Alliance, a series of lectures in soft skills development and also workshops that they happen face-to-face uh, -face in Crete every year. Here is also my colleague Tatiana, if Tatiana is with us still, that we call, we organize this. So we start with online sections and you know some of the students, they are participants over there and we finalize this with workshops. And what we are doing, we are just monitoring what are the most important soft skills that market is looking for, but also what, you know, the job opportunities and you know what you know a researcher as well uh, is doing and through this we also adapt new pedagogies because i think that the way that we teach also is a way how the people they can cultivate together with the fundamental information about different soft skills how to train soft skills so with this i would like to close and i mean we are on your uh, disposal uh, milva that we can, we would like to collaborate as a European university through the Athena soft skills training and materials and events that we have and through the impact with your services, you know, immediately. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure, I'm taking note of this because it's, a, yes. as I was saying, it's a great importance, this aspect of soft skills. Uh, yes. By the way, yes. at first you were uh, saying that you want, would like to have more information on the project than you mentioned. So yes. I've put the link in the chat and you can go there. Uh, and navigate and play a bit with the tools and the body of knowledge and so on. Just let us know your opinions. Excellent, excellent. So thank you all of you for your participation. We will continue next Friday 
with a, a speaker from Spain, from Barcelona, that they are going to speak about carbon nanotubes and energy. Uh, of course, you know, I will inform all of you in order to join. Milva and uh, Danny left because he had the work. Thank you very much. Uh, we are very much grateful and we are looking forward in order to collaborate because this yeah. is also another motivation of this event. Yeah, for sure. And many greetings to Tatiana that uh, I see she's You know even online. Tatiana, you know everyone. Yeah, I know Tatiana, yeah, because we work together in, in the previous projects, bl the Blended Aim project, the Praxis project before. Oh, so, the story, yeah. now. Long more, story, you know, yes. <laughs> Okay, so we have to make the long story short, so we have to close here. Yeah. Bye. Enjoy the weekend. And you too. See you next week. See bye. you. Bye. Thank bye you very bye. much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.